Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sketchcraft, the podcast for art, games, and process junkies. I'm Rob Duenius, graphic artist Esquire, and you are watching the making of He-Man, the commission I did, the Masters of the Universe commission. So it's going to be pretty long. This is the 90-minute uh, drawing portion. So um, let's get on with it, shall we? Let me go ahead and hit play, and we can get going. So let me tell you a little bit about what you're seeing. I'm kind of holding up my tools, tools I use. Mostly when I'm working on a, a pencil piece, I just use two lead holders. One that has an, a 2H lead and, and the other one that has an HB lead. Uh, it's a softer lead. The 2H is a harder lead and that sort of enables me to do sort of really thin, sort of precise details. And then the HB lead is pretty softer. I can do a little bit more textury, kind of gritty stuff. So uh, pretty cheap. No big deal. The eraser was a tough stuff eraser. I get those online at pretty nifty little 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 eraser that, that picks up uh, small details and I like it better than an electric eraser so this is me sort of starting off hold on let me get some water blocking in the head anytime I start a drawing uh, it's pretty slow it's pretty slow to start so here here you're getting a <laughs> uh, me sort of working in the chiseled sort of Schwarzenegger kind of style face. You know, with this piece, I, I always notice He-Man drawings tend to follow in one or of two sort of formats. Either they look just like the cartoon, or they tend to look like a Joe Mad kind of battle chasers-y thing, and I really wanted neither. Um, with this, I really... And well, at first I thought I'd do kind of like a 80s, sort of like real 80s vibe, like with the rock posters, you know, so you'll kind of see in my sketch underneath, uh, he has really big kind of 80s rocker hair, and I don't really end up drawing that. As a matter of fact, I think I do draw it, and then I erase it, so we'll, we'll sort of explore that option uh, as we go along here. Uh, but I know that with his anatomy, I wanted to do something somewhere between comic book and, and somewhere really gritty. Uh, there was a bit more of an edge to him, you know, than, than say, the cartoon would imply. Uh, you'll notice as I go through, I tend to block in all my shapes first, this is using the 2H, and then I'll go and do the gritty detail stuff with uh, the HB. And, you know, we'll cover this more as we sort of see it, but just to sort of say it for the first time, and I'll probably repeat myself a couple times. You know, you can, you can shade and do all the little, like, texturing you want, you know, but if your understructure, your form, your shapes aren't three-dimensional, then you're just sort of, like, shading over pretty pretty flat areas so what I'm sort of doing here is I'm building a three-dimensional model in my head like I'm taking some shapes that when I went in my sketch period my sketch phase maybe I didn't completely work out but here I'm sort of really building a topography if you will mentally for myself adding all these thin little seam lines and you know I'm going over his his I mean it's cartoonish comic book anatomy at the end of the day but um but I like to think of it more like an action figure or a really cool kind of sculpture in a way. There I'm drawing through his wrists and his little forearms there. and I'll add his gauntlets uh, kind of over that. I really do move pretty slowly when I first start. Things pretty much pick up after I get the main focus uh, element kind of blocked in. But here I'm sort of really taking my time and... I know it can drive some of my uh, live stream viewers a little crazy in real time because I've had people go, my grandma draws faster than you, but only at first. Toward at, at the end, people will turn away for five minutes, come back, and the whole thing's changed. So, so there I sort of drew that forearm underneath, and then I kind of worked in the gauntlet trying to figure out where the lines would actually match up a little bit. And uh, if you're wondering what kind of paper that is, it's just standard Bristol 500 ply uh, boards. I don't get the stuff with the comic book lines printed on them because it gets in the way of the art. And I find it to be a real fucking chore to remove when I scan in in Photoshop. So I just like to print out my own boards with a printer. I have a Canon Pixma. You used to have a Canon i99. They can print up to 13 by 19 so you can print out your own boards. So people ask me all the time uh, who my influences are, and I would say that depends on the project. 
because in any given project, I sort of look at what is influencing me towards the material. Uh, like if I were to do a case in point, you know, when I worked on Richie Rich stuff, my influences were, were very much somewhere between Jeff Smith from Bone uh, and uh, a lot of the a lot of anime and, and, and some of the, uh, I wouldn't say Jeff Matsuda stuff, but some of the, a lot of that sort of, yeah, I'd say a little bit of Jeff Matsuda was, was in there, you know, some, somewhere. Uh, sort of that high attention to detail animation stuff. Uh, but with this He-Man piece, you know, I, I would say this kind of falls in my uh, sort of 90s comic art, uh, somewhere like Stephen Platt, Joe Mad. Uh, but again, I, I believe I said this before, The uh, if I haven't, because I had to re-record this, this commentary twice. Uh, you know, again, with He-Man poses going into this, most He-Man art tends to fall in one of two things. Yeah, like I said, um, either it looks like the cartoon verbatim or it looks like a Battle Chasers piece. So I really wanted this to have a bit more weight to, to it than that. I didn't want him to look all shiny and cartoony. I wanted him to look sort of beat down like he's been, you know, he's been fighting like in Gladiator, you know? So um, it's sort of probably why I make the hair change too. But I can tell you right now, this part of the drawing, I'm feeling pretty confident about the shapes. You know, here's what's kind of funny is I'll, I'll do this uh, sort of gritty texturing on the piece. I know a lot of people like the drawing just as this, though. I get a lot of, uh, you know, Rob, you don't have to add all that texture. You can just leave it like that. It looks fine. And I would agree with you. I did that for the most of my career. But I found that uh, majority of the people, editors and audience alike, sort of saw it as being cartoony when I would do that. So um, I think maybe in the future I might scan the whole piece before I, I do this textured version just to give some folks the opportunity to have a version of it without all the crazy grit. But, you know, I like the grit. I, I It's something I grew up on. Uh, it gives an added dimensionality to the piece. I think that it only tends to fall apart when you cheat the drawing. So I really struggle drawing. Oh, you can see here, this is me drawing the, the 80s, the big 80s band hair. I really, and I even give him these like long, like Zelda, like, like, sorry, Link, you know, from Legend of Zelda, kind of like tassels and stuff. I was going to go way God, but then way 80s rocker. But you know, somewhere around here, I'm like, you know what, man, it's just, just overkill i don't know i mean maybe maybe people wouldn't have cared it's very has like a little bit of an anime influence there i suppose it's very like cloud right cloud strife from final fantasy but you're going to see me put a lot of effort into something that i'm going to erase here pretty uh sometime in the future it's pretty fun but i, I stressed greatly with his face do you make the chin really big do you make him look like garrett from battle chasers do you make him look like uh you know, like Schwarzenegger, do you make him look, I mean, there's so many ways, I mean, the one way I was not going to do it was I was not going to make him look like a Prince Art, Prince Valiant, you know, bull haircut, uh, flame tard, I just, I, <laughs> it's funny, it's funny to watch, but I, no desire, I really wanted to draw the, you know, sort of, image comics version of He-Man, in a way, the old image comics, it's the stuff I grew up with, you know, and anytime I get an opportunity to sort of do my own thing, you know, I'll find a different way to do it. Some of the layouts um, have some influences. Like there's a little bit of Drew Struzan with my layout. Uh, this, is, this is what I call a cinema shot, which is like poster art. So a lot of these sort of classical kind of like poser, poster comp compositions come from like uh, Drew Struzan, uh, Bob Peake, the way posters were used when they used to be illustrated before uh, Photoshop came along and ruined that. Uh, very thirsty. Very warm in my room tonight. So, uh, you know, a lot of people ask me about, you know, or how do I draw like this? How, you know, how do I get my art to look, you know, professional or to look awesome or whatever? And I have to say, you know, you really got to start at your construction. I spent a long time learning how to construct figures, and especially when I learned how I learned how to animate in two D, like actual two D animation, and that is all about. Uh, shapes like you're actually animating shapes and volumes and then uh, I took a lot of 3d even though I didn't enjoy working in 3d programs I did take away 
you know, reinforce the fact that you sort of build off three-dimensional structures, whether they're realistic or cartoony is irrelevant. They are three-dimensional. So uh, I've always applied it to my art. Make sure the art is three-dimensional, whether you have shading and details uh, on top of it. And then you can sort of apply all the amount of details and shading or even style you want. But that three-dimensional structure goes a long way. You know, even if you're you're over-proportioning shapes or, you know, maybe fudging some of the perspective because it doesn't look right and whatnot. Uh, if it's just really flat, and uh, it's uninteresting. You know, I try to add energy into my art, whether the character is jumping or standing, I think, you know, a sense of attitude and energy. Now, here's something, too, to kind of jump jump a little bit that finger is not exactly if you look on his left hand that's holding the the axe i wanted the axe to be, come out towards me and i just couldn't turn his arm in a way that sort of reinforced it so i sort of came up with a weird pose using my own hand that technically would work i mean if you were that strong of a dude he could pull that off but i think i drew the the finger too long under the second knuckle or the first knuckle, yeah. So you got his knuckle connects to his hand and his mid-knuckle right there. And that first knuckle, I think that's probably a little too long, but, yeah. You know, like, you, you, those sort of things, you, I think I find charming in a way. Like, that's kind of like what makes an artist, you know. Sometimes it's their mistakes that, that make, when people say, how do you get a style, Rob? How do I How do I get a style? You know, even, regardless of how you draw, uh, whether you draw really cartoony or really serious stuff, I sort of believe it's your mistakes that like define how you draw it. That's why people can always say, "Oh, I knew this guy drew it," because you're, you know, I always find I'm constantly, uh, f you know, sort of fucking up uh, in places where, where I uh, didn't mean to, but it's consistent across all art styles and, and pieces. So here we're zooming out. I mean, I got the front part kind of blocked in, and I'm, I know that I definitely want to get that that axe and his front leg kind of figured out before I start rendering anything. Uh, I'm really not happy with the hair. <laughs> I know I'm not happy with the hair. And here I am trying to like, I'll fix it with shading. This is the 2B pencil. The uh, camera I use to record is this place right above me. It's uh, hanging off a desk. So it's a little hard to kind of like, sometimes I'm trying to make sure my hand is not too much in the way, but I mean, at some point you just have to like turn that off and just get to making the art, you know. So there'll be a lot of me working and then my hand pulls back and you'll sort of see the magic. So uh, and I also you'll find that sometimes it falls off camera. I, I constantly look up when I draw to avoid that, but it happens. Here I'm adding little chin, chin grits, like little stubble. When it comes to sort of details like this, uh, I call it like a brutal. I think the brutal is the sort of word I come for it. Uh, my influences in this kind of a style would definitely run along the lines of like Stephen Platt, Greg Capullo, Jim Lee, that kind of that kind of uh, thing from the early '90s. You know, Silvestri. Not that I'm holding a picture of them open when I'm working. I mean, sometimes I do. Like sometimes I'll have a piece of that art around me just to kind of keep me on target because I don't exactly commit all the kinds of brush strokes to memory. Uh, so it's good to have a little piece of inspirational art. Plus it's good to have a, I mean, when I drew as a kid, I had the same stuff near me. So I sort of like to feel like I'm tapping into the same kind of enthusiasm I had when I was 13, 14, 15, even today, 20 years later, right? If you can believe that. Uh, 20 years. So let's move on. <laughs> That's a pretty manly face. Look at that. And he's pissed off. I really try to get those faces going first. You know, if you can connect with your character, like they sort of feel like they're looking back at you, I feel like half the work is already done. Although, it is funny. When I really feel like they're connecting with me, I'll get people say, your characters are emotionless. You know. So. It might just be what's going on in my head. You know. 
So if you see me pause a little bit on these videos, it's because I'm taking a second to think, you know. And that can be anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes, so they, they only occur for like a minute or two here. And, uh, yeah, this is again with the little, the, uh, the HB. I like the HB, it's default lead that comes with lead holders. It's pretty smooth, glides pretty easily, effortlessly. Uh, messy. Ah, yeah. uh, this hair. <laughs> uh, I, I know when I was doing this, I, I, I can remember pretty clearly thinking like I will oh man that hair came off camera huh it's, I, I, I caught myself as I looked up see I remember thinking like yeah I'll just you know with the right kind of like shading I can make this work and it just did not work <laughs> and then I got real scared because I did an initial demo piece of this before I started where I kind of rendered them out a little bit and uh, that is a definitely a different drawing look at that crazy i think i think i erased some of the details from his face too when i erased the hair and i had to kind of redraw him in because it looks a little different to me but i might be wrong i don't know maybe i should have kept the hair <laughs> uh i guess sometimes that's where like having an editor can help you know sometimes you don't know which way you want to go and like i can really sort of use like them as an excuse an editor or an art director you can sort of go what do you think uh, this one, and you're like, good, you know, and then when people complain about it, I go, ah, he picked it, you know, I, you know it's not my fault. <laughs> I'm doing some secondary shading with the very light shading with the, uh, 2H, by the way. Sort of block in where I want to go with stuff, and then I'll go in with the HB half the time. Although I think this is the HB, second half. But I know I do a lot of secondaries, uh, lighter shading with the HB. No, oh, sorry, the 2H. This uh, cross hatching is pretty interesting. I never fully remember how I do it. And if I would keep it on camera, I could watch how I'm doing it. Uh, normally I'd probably start shading on something not so close to the viewer just to uh give me some warm-up man keep pulling that closer to me i really need to just turn the camera closer you know so that's a lesson you know to constantly just turn the camera inward so i can keep it closer to my chest so a little tricky drawing with the camera above you because uh your head can block the way a lot of times too but you'll see, like, the shading, like, the way to kind of get around it is to kind of weight it underneath, right? So I get the solid shapes underneath, uh, the solid shading underneath the shape, and then I do cross hatch on top of that. So it's like a matter of, like, Xing one way and Xing the other, and then sort of, like, ticking across back and forth, back and forth. I mean, there's, I mean, I could sit here and try to do some video where I, like, exactly show it, uh, but to be perfectly honest with you, just give it a shot, like... Just, you know, take some shapes, an arm or whatever, and uh, just sort of, like, underweight, you know, if, like, see that back muscle right there? The bottom part of it's, like, a solid color, I mean, solid shade, and then as it rounds over, and you want to, like, shade over a curved surface, uh, sort of back and forth, one way and then the other, and then tick back and forth, sort of, like, blend it together a little bit. It's just really not very clean and perfect, which is what I like about it. Yeah, I remember when I was a kid, Stephen Platt uh, was sort of the guy that I picked a lot of that up from, um, McFarlane, too, uh, and Jim Lee. But um, but what I really liked about that kind of look at the day was that it was very, very unclean and just mean. And I found that uh, I, kept, I kept buying a lot of the art. You know, I mean, yeah, his perspective and his anatomy was a little, you know, that was wonky in places, but I never really cared. Uh... It just sort of, I guess it has like that, it, I guess for me it, it, it was what heavy metal is for some people, you know? Heavy metal is what heavy metal is, you could say. Whatever that means to you, for good or ill, it, you, there's no real way to like justify it or, you know, deny it. You know, it's, it's heavy metal. So for me, that in comics, that he had that sort of quality. 
And I remember I kept going to eBay to find, to rebuy a lot of his art. Um, and finally I just got fed up with it. I'm like, I think I could just make some of this stuff. You know, like, I don't want to draw like this all the time, but I definitely think I can make this stuff. I like how he used to draw before his art got real clean, which I didn't really care for. And so a lot of this is just step and repeat. You know, there's no real magic trick to it. Uh, it's a lot of time in. And, and I'm using the, uh, I'm also drawing little tick marks and little, like, gashes in his skin and little little flavors. Uh, understand that when you draw this much stuff into a piece, when it goes to color, most of it's going to disappear. So I would say I'm going to lose a third of this detail once the color gets added. And you'll see that as we go through the coloring phase of the, uh, of the commentary on the coloring commentary, that uh, it a lot of it disappears. Uh, so it's really just sort of there to sort of, I call it like resolution, you know, like I'm adding resolution to the piece. And uh, it makes for a really, really good, like, now hold on, it makes for a really good piece for the, the client, like if someone bought it, you know. Uh, okay, in this case, this was a commission, so. But you'll see his hair, I added a little secondary shadow right there with the, that's with the 2H. And that just makes the hair look like it's above him, you know. It's not really based on any great light source. I keep looking at that hair. If you see me pause, I, that's me looking at the hair going, man, I just, I just don't know about that. I wish the toys were built like this. <laughs> I did love the cartoon when I was a kid, if you're wondering. I remember my uncles and my, my dad and my everyone making fun of me as a kid, too. Like, this is retarded. Even when I was four or five, like, they knew it was retarded, but I didn't care. Surprisingly, this is the first and only time I've ever drawn them. Maybe when I was like little, but I've never drawn them other than this. So, yep, yeah, and here I go. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm so glad this is captured on film because, you know, that's where the tough stuff's really coming handy. Those things. I use art gum first to pick up all the major stuff, and then, yeah, and then the uh, tough stuff to. So here we go. Now I know I'm in uncharted territory. I'll tell you, there's two parts of this drawing that I was uncertain about: his hair, and Battle Cat's face. I make a lot of that up as I go. I just um, I was really rusty when I had done this piece. And you're gonna be like, but how is this rusty? I assure you, it was. To me, Rusty isn't um, you not being able to draw well. It's you not having the confidence to draw uh, confidently. And so when I don't feel confident about how I'm drawing, I'm Rusty. I'm constantly slowing down and ticking. I probably shouldn't erase that mouth. Why did I erase that mouth? See, that's where it changed. Eh, I like the first mouth. Don't ask me why I did that. I know that right now I'm like, I'm leaving it be. Much better than... No, I like this hair better. <laughs> uh, it's tough, right? And I'll get 50-50. I'll get 50 emails going, I like the other hair, that would have been great. This hair is fine, I like this better. There's really no one answer to it. So, I mean, like, we're, like, 23, 25 minutes into the video, and I'm still, like, dicking around with this hair. That's how you know an artist is rusty. <laughs> You're going to see a lot of jumping back and forth with eraser and pencil just to kind of smooth this all in. And that's the 2H, and I'll come and do light shading just to kind of, yeah, just kind of. Add a little something so it's not some thin piece of art. Little extra shadows, little tick lines. Nah, it looks much better. Good call, Rob. Good call. <laughs> Gotta wear a little cappy when I draw, too, with this camera, because uh, it picks up everything.
do 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 his little chest emblem you know actually i did another version of him in my notebooks i do a lot of sketching of the characters before i start and my initial take was much different than this i actually came with an idea of the way you could do the cartoon modern and you know he was detailed but he was a bit more cartoony in his proportions uh, i like this version better but i have a version of adam where the prince version of him isn't like this it's a little thin scrawny kid so you sort of go the captain marvel route where he's a thin little kid and Battle Cat's this little itty bitty kitten on a big red pillow, you know, for the queen. And he's sort of, you know, as an acting prince put in charge of caretaking her princely cat, you know. She values the cat more than him. And uh, his only responsibility to be trusted with is the cat. So. <laughs> but then now, you know, with the power of the sword and whatnot, he can become He Man. You get sort of like a really cool barbarian take on the Captain Marvel motif. I'm definitely considering putting together like maybe a 24 page comic sometime or some book like just here's the way I would do with a property, you know, like as a scholastic review. Here's some model sheets. Here's my takes on it. I tried to get this into Play Magazine when I worked there for years and even Game Fan, but could never get people to sign off on it. I definitely think that's something that I might be able to pull off, like, on a Kickstarter or something. Oh, look at we're shading the pecs. The man teats. Tick, 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 back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, yeah. Trying to, like, get that musculature to go kind of tucked underneath his... I always find that shoulder armpit area to be a little, a little tricky. I don't think a lot of people do it, do it well. Not that I'm saying I do, but I, it's just one of those things I focus on. So again, I'm going to say, you know, if you want to really like, start to get your stuff to a point where you feel it's professional looking you know first get your construction down spend a long time learning that learn perspective form structure uh, and then you know apply you know shape and shape design get very creative with your shapes even now i feel like i could punch my shapes up more um, i think i would i have a whole different style of commission i would do for that so i could sort of use that to explore more wilder shapes and shape design so i call this one uh like i said it's brutal but i could definitely come up with a name for something that's a little bit crazier his little abdomen this is probably the funnest part to draw for me i wish i had abs like that <laughs> doesn't like every dude he's like a little little narcissism like man that'd be cool but i'm not willing to put in the time to get them <laughs> so we're you know we're like i said we're not exactly at the halfway mark but somewhere along this we're getting close and i'm not halfway done so uh you know obviously in the next 20 minutes or so you know we'll be at the halfway mark and uh and it just sort of speeds up Especially towards the bottom. Now, if you're asking, wondering what all these bits flying around everywhere are for, uh, no reason whatsoever. It just adds energy. Most of them disappear once I add the color. So it's really a cool bonus for like the pencil pieces. I sell a lot of copies of the line art at cons and stuff, and on my Etsy store. Uh, matter of fact, you can get a copy of this. Uh, I have a few left at my Etsy store. I got links in the uh, the video. Obviously, you can. Get a copy of the color and the pencils for $25 plus shipping if you need international. Yeah. But um, it adds a little bit extra for people who just like the pencils and stuff, you know. But a lot of it fades in. You know, when I have my, I, I did the flats on this one myself when I did the coloring, but uh, I know a lot of flatters go through and actually fill in all those bits and I... I never use it. Feel sorry for them. I try to tell them not to, but they do anyway. Sometimes I forget. I'm like, ooh, I hope they didn't kill themselves on that. But...
Yeah, it's pretty ripped. <laughs> yeah, he's ripped. Just like Rob. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, the two edge can add a lot of really great secondary shadows and the line weights are so vastly different they don't like cross over interfere they sort of layer which is nice yeah apparently he-man has a pouch i never noticed until i started looking at the reference art in greater detail so this is his pouch don't ask me what that's for i imagine toilet paper <laughs> maybe it's a uh, ninja magic palms or something I think those little spike things pointing downward are like my my little addition to his wooly his wooly loincloth area. Anytime you got one of those little button I call them button shapes where it sort of like buttons out and then sinks in, you know, these disc those are always fun to, to do a little cross hatching with. They always look cool. You know, I can honestly say at this point in the drawing, it's pretty much just step and repeat. You know, you're doing a lot of the same things. You're building the shape and then you're going over and you're rendering the three-dimensionality of it with the shading and then you're adding in all this extra texture and detail. And so this is why I don't mind doing like live streaming at this point because I'm going to have to kill four or five hours doing this. Of course, when I was you know younger, this might take me... 16 18 hours to do but i can do this in about four to six hours give or take speed you know paying attention hmm. you know when i would do this kind of shading and other people would color my art uh, I used to have a colorist, Diego. He's some damn good colors, but uh, he used to piss him off that I would do this kind of shading because he goes, "Your light sources just don't make any sense." And I'm like, "Yeah, I know. I mean, there's it's lit from multiple angles. Like I'm using the shadow to pop the shapes out, you know, rather than just straight key light it. Like, I mean, I know how to set up a a three light scheme. I could do a key light, a backlight, and an under light, sort of like block them out and then create a shadow, but with this stuff, I'm really using the shading to really pop form out, you know. It doesn't matter to me if it's 100% realistic. It's iconic. Um, I don't think this stuff can be done realistically. I mean, honestly, it's not a realistic art style, you know. It'd probably just look like an Alex Ross drawing if it, uh, if it had that kind of basic shadowing going on. So I'm adding all these little shades to the uh, little... This is supposed to be this little like fuzzy underwear, but I make it look more like this sort of metallic kind of sharp feathers or something. Anything to kind of make something that looks kind of kind of lame, a little bit more aggressive. It's kind of what I'm going for there. And that sort of attention to little detail pays off in the coloring phase because you don't have to do as much. One thing I, I've done, I've spent a lot of time studying colorists. Uh, I think I probably should have just been a colorist. Um, I think I could have, if I had just done colors, I could have started my career around 2001. Instead, or 2000, as opposed to, say, 2005, 2007. So I probably could have started five or six years earlier. Oh, here I'm not wearing the hat. I, I may, I fix that. But um, I found that around the, the early 90s is when I really started collecting comics, and I really got into a lot of colorists. But I was there at the dawn of the digital age, and, and there was sort of this transition between guys that did four-color co process coloring and digital coloring. So probably the best four color colorist I'd ever seen was Gregory Wright, and he's a colorist on a lot of like the Tom McFarlane Spider-Man books, Ghost Rider, and stuff. And uh, you know 
he when he went to digital, it just didn't look the same. And one of the reasons I noticed was they stopped using a lot of heavy blacks when they went to digital coloring because uh, it looked real muddy. And they stopped using a lot of inking as time went on. So I found that when they used to use a lot more blacks and heavy inks and they had these basic color schemes, the colors didn't have to do much because the colors... The ink, the, the line art would be so detailed, the color was just sort of there enhancing the line art. And I found that that's similar here. Like, uh, I don't actually have to render as much. I've seen, you know, really clean art has to be really hyper rendered to get all that. You're doing all the airbrushing in Photoshop. And I just think that if the line art already has a lot of that detail built in, then the colorist just actually gets to create atmosphere as opposed to trying to become the person who's drawing the second half of the image which is really strange because kind of how it used to be in comics is that you know you did like a breakdown drawing and then an inker kind of did the other half of the drawing and the colors kind of you know went on top of that and now it's like i sort of feel like it's basically just penciler and colorist and it's usually like one more than the other uh, sometimes you get a really great combination but Seeing as how I color my own art, uh, I sort of, I'm able to like figure out, okay, I can add all this stuff here. And even if it's a little too black, I can just add a little paint over the, I can color on top of some of the line art, which colorists are really afraid to do because they don't want to cover up things you spent time drawing. And some of the stuff has to have a little color on top of the black to kind of not make it as, as, as muddy. Uh, but, you know, try to tell colorists they can do that and they won't, you know, they're, and, it, and it's understandably so. I mean, it's the same, like, you know, with colorists, I would change their work. And they're like, I got paid on the colorist. It's my job. You know, and I, I don't want to be that guy who's, like, trying to do everyone else's job but his own. So if you just do everything, then, you know, it's accepted. <laughs> uh, I know. In pursuit of perfectionism. So this is the little bandanas. Anytime I can add a bandana to something, I always have it waving in the wind you know, just to add motion. Uh, I really think it's it's a skill to get a drawing where people aren't doing something action-heavy to move regardless. Not a lot of artists can do it. I find art... Art bores me when it's static and it just sits there, not doing much. Uh, I like there to be motion. Uh, only I hate drawing a lot of motion, especially when I did animation. You know, it's like 3,000 drawings to get like 10 seconds worth of effort you know is not my idea of fun so being able to add a lot of motion to a still drawing has always been the goal this axe i knew was going to require a lot of work and here you're, you're it's kind of fun really to see because that is just a basic basic shape i mean if people say oh rob you know look at the axe you you drew it really really well well there's really no drawing there look at that it's just a i mean it's literally just a flat shape and this is where uh, you know, okay, I said make everything three-dimensional, but I also know that when it comes to this axe, that a lot of that three-dimensionality is going to come from some of the rendering. So, um, you know, follow your rules until you know when to break them. I think, like, every artist has said that. Like, you know, I can break my own rules because I understand them. Uh, and I adhere to them for the most part. But it's okay to deviate from the course. But yeah, it's going to be pretty fun to watch that get done. Look at all those little ticks I'm adding. What's the point of that? Because it's cool. <laughs> oh, look at that little, little chip and chip marks and little holes and his little tattered. Yeah, I really never liked those... Uh, fantasy films where people aren't dirty you know i'm like the past was filthy and yeah, they're always clean i hate that and that's why i like braveheart when i first saw it because everyone looked pretty pretty filthy and i think dragon slayer when i was a kid was a pretty dirty looking movie too and the first star wars movie was really dirty looking which i liked Not to say that I would draw Star Wars like this. I mean, this is a bit much. <laughs> this is a little much for Star Wars, I think. 
you know, maybe a monster that they were fighting, something like this, but to draw Luke Skywalker like this would just be overkill. Yeah, that's where having a little range helps. You know, you don't want to get locked in. For me, I don't I don't want to get locked into one way of drawing. You know, the, the way of drawing comes out when I want to achieve a certain emotion based on the subject material. It's not it's not me plugging, you know, my little pony into this style, which would be interesting to see, but it's not that at all. Now if you look at that right there, you can see a picture of Battle Cap. If you look, his mouth is closed, and that changes when I go to actually draw him. So you see there, I filled up that bracelet, a gauntlet, whatever you want to call it, with a bracelet, with some shadow, keeping the shadow semi-transparent because it looks cool. And there's a lot of this like loosely kind of like cross-hatching going back over, adding little tick marks, little crest marks, little bits, reinforcing little dot marks. All those little ticks build an additional amount of detail. I don't know how you put that in a book. You know, when you talk about like art books and how to teach people how to do this stuff, I don't know how you do that. It, it doesn't exist. There aren't enough pages. You know, I'm explaining it to you now and you're seeing it. Even if it was in real time, it'd be hard to explain why or how, you know? See, I am trying to build those, those shapes three-dimensionally. Even though that's probably not how you should hold an axe, it looks cool. At some point, guys, I mean, I'm not, I'm probably not that great an artist, so... You know, if I get here, like, you can never hold an axe that way. It's not the proper way or something. I, I don't really care, you know. Like, I'm having fun with shapes. And at this point, I've spent so many years trying to do things the right way uh, that now I sort of, I, I feel that the only things you really need to really understand are, are, are construction, composition, and attitude. Like, to me, those are the most important things, whether that's, Something that could actually be done or not is irrelevant because a lot of the subject material I draw can't be done. I mean, look at the size of that guy with that giant battle axe and Skeletor is a talking skeleton. None of that can actually exist. So, Would I apply these techniques to portraits of, you know, realistic portraits? Probably not, you know. But I'd be tracing over photographs if I was doing realistic portraits because that's the fastest way to get that done. And I can do that. It's actually kind of fun sometimes. So I'm adding this sort of core shadow to begin with. Core shadow is the darkest part of your area. Um, should be pretty bright right next to a core shadow. And that, that makes an image pop forward. So if you want to have a, a part of your item to pop forward, make the core shadow towards you. You know, if you want to have it recede backward, make the core shadow go around towards the back. There's a little blood splatters I'm all drawn in. I plan on doing a lot of blood on that axe. Now, there's something you'll never see in a He-Man cartoon. Blood. Everyone's got guns and swords, but no one's getting tore the fuck up. Drew me nuts when I was a kid. Hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of ticks. Here we go, the axe. So I'll start with these little, like, axe gashes. I definitely picked that one up from Platt. <laughs> I remember him being a very divisive artist at my school when I was a kid. His faces are ugly. They're tiny heads and over-enlarged musculature. I'm like, yeah, but it looks cool. I know. I know, I know, but it looks cool to me. <laughs> you know, and yet I keep buying it, you know. So. I really like the the grit though they they used to do. And I understand that the majority of the comic book industry doesn't want to ever see that style reappear ever again. <sighs> so I have to make it <laughs> I don't know why I don't know why I like it so anytime I go back and do this it's not necessarily because those pieces need more extra detail 
It's because I'm thinking about that damn axe and I don't know what to do. I'm just like, it's flat and it's a stupid axe shape. I need to make this work, you know? So I'm working on any other little piece I can. And then coming back and adding a couple bits. I'm just kind of hoping at some point it'll click for me. That's the 2H right there I believe I'm using to shade his thumb. See how you know, the shadow pops it forward. Sometimes it's a mistake. People think that shadows put things in the back. But things are actually lighter as they move away from you. They're darker as they get close. I think my thought on this is if I use the 2H to kind of add extra ticks and details in the axe, I can kind of slowly ramp my way up to the detail. It is tough starting with a large open area like that. Because you never know where to really start placing the grit, you know. So again, shadows first and sort of working from there. Now that's the secondary shadow going across his wrist with the 2H. So it's really lighter compared to the darker stuff. If you try to do this all with one pencil, it's just going to look like a big, muddy mess. I know some artists who use several pencils when they draw. And that just drives me crazy. Well, uh, my, my lead holders have two grips, too. The uh, 2H has a smooth grip, and the HP has a textured grip. So I can feel which one I'm using when I'm working, because I'll forget sometimes. You know. I'm going back over his shoulder to add more texture. That shoulder is just not textury enough. But you can see it's looking pretty three-dimensional, you know, already. It's amazing how that works out. The human mind. Yeah, this was one of those pieces that I should have worked out better before I printed it. But I was so, like, just wanting to get on with life at this point. I was like, I'll just work it out in the drawing. So that was painful. Oh, that's another rule, too, I always break. Always get as much done uh, in whatever stage you can before you. You, know, you don't want to be like, oh, it's saying I got from movies where it's like, they always say they'll fix it in post. You know, we'll do a special effect, we'll do a special effect. And at the end of the day, your whole movie's become a bunch of special effects. You don't actually have to do any work, right? Uh, but there's not enough time to do all the special effects. So anything you can do at that stage, the better. So I know that the first thing I know on this piece to do is to add the blood. I think that's where I sort of made my mark. I was like, if I start to fill in the blood areas, then I can sort of texture around that sort of blood pattern. I sort of feel like the axe could probably be just a video in and of itself. You know? Now this is, see, I'm shading, and then as I come out, I go towards the tip and tick back and forth, back and forth, sort of just flicking off on the bottom and then flicking back on the top to kind of add this kind of like textury, kind of gritty cross-hatching. It's like the wrist movement I'm making. I think that I think you can hear that music. Let me turn that down. That's annoying. So. I never know what to say during moments like this like it's there's really no way to like shortcut this stuff you know if you don't like to sit there and noodle on a piece for a bit if you kind of want to just get it done then don't draw like this <laughs> there's nice some now this I'm doing to add some level of like validity to the topography of the axe it's a big battle gash and I'll do like it's almost like moon circles in a way these sort of big, like, thump, thump, thumps. Like, he's sort of been using it to shield himself from maybe spears or something. And this sort of helps make it make the, the axe feel like it's actually there, even though it's just a flat shape. And a lot of this little understructure shading will help, too, with that.
and we move to the next side. Oh, look, little screws. Screws are a great way to make something feel like it's there, too. I always add little screws. Why are there screws in an axe? Because it's fantasy. <laughs> Why not? They bolted the sides together, you know. It's, axes aren't made that way, but... Meh. For some reason, I sort of feel that, you know, the, the Joe Mad style is sort of like the way comic book artists draw fantasy now. Like, you just open up the Darksiders art book and you copy-paste. I mean, I love Joe Mad's art like anyone else, but I never felt inclined. Which is really funny because a lot of people like liking my stuff. Oh, you remind me of Joe Mad. You should draw Battle Chasers. And I'm like, well, I wouldn't. I mean, I have an anime influence, but I don't think I would draw Battle Chasers like Battle Chasers. I am planning some Darksiders stuff, though. So we'll see how that works out. The tips are where you can add a lot of, like, you see these strokes I do that kind of come inward and kind of grit around the tips. And that really just sort of helps edge them out, again, because they're darker. I think I was a little too far away from the mic there. So... his loincloth which I made really long I mean I guess there's no way you could fight with that in battle could probably fucking trip right over it but meh <laughs> you know that's the thing you know and it really always was uh sort of the art I grew up with was always about making things look more iconic and to have character uh as opposed to being you know useful combat items I mean, obviously, you know, he'd be wearing little fuzzy pants and have a small helmet if it was an actual battle uniform, but... Well, we're a little over the halfway mark, and there's a lot more drawing to go. I mean, his whole sword, shield, you know, his legs, Skeletor, the logo, the castle isn't done. And this is where you're going to see me. I didn't speed the video up. I'm just going to be moving a lot faster. That axe takes up a lot of page coverage, though. So... And lots of little grit and texture lines to the loincloth. Little ticks back, 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 forth, back, 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 forth. Okay. Some long shadowing. This is that core shadow. Back, back, forth, forth. Yeah, I mean, I haven't even started the sword. It's crazy. It's crazy how that works. A little extra shadow right there to pop the front forward. Sort of the rule of McFarlane drapery, right? Joe Mad had pretty good drapery, though. I, I did enjoy the way he would, like, get Magneto's cape to move around. I always thought that stuff was pretty cool. Now I'm like, maybe I'll work on Skeletor. Like, I gotta get the rest of this drawing going at some point. Ah, the logo. So because it's a poster commission, I tend to draw the logos in. I think for the final coloration, yeah, it doesn't look as professional. You know, obviously it looks more like a sketch of a logo than anything else. So... I don't know how I feel about the final execution of it, but it looks really cool when it's just a penal, penciled commission. I probably should spend more time on the text, making sure it's absolutely perfect, but I mean, honestly, for what I charge for these commissions, <laughs> then I'm like, you know, man, 
Does everything have to be perfect, Rob? You know, what are you gonna do? You gonna spend three hours on the logo and then what? You know, three hours on the rest of the piece. So. You know, you guys, at the end of the day, you know, with any piece of art, you need to sort of pick and choose the battles you want to have. Like, you can't have everything, so what has to be there? You know, what, what really should be the thing you want to fight for, you know? Logo rendering is not high on my list. It's there, that's great, but this is why I'm sort of blazing through it, because it's just going to eat up time when the characters no one no one buys these because i drew the logo really well they buy them because of the characters so that's sort of the uh the justification algorithm i use to spending as little amount of time on it as i have to now i'm using the 2h there to shade So it looks like it's coming above the logo. <laughs> you know, it's, when I'm working on this, I, I can't exactly say I'm always self-analyzing the pieces I work on it part of me is like I think I when I'm pausing that's when I'm doing it and then I just go and do it and then while I'm working on it I try to place my mind somewhere not here I try to bevel that text a little bit too very very thin amounts of bevel very basic beveling now I'm gonna add a little texture a little ticks and stuff to make it feel more more three-dimensional. I do like the way they used to airbrush logos in the 80s, like when they actually manually would airbrush that chrome look, like the WWF logo and obviously the Masters of the Universe logo. Now this is where I'm just sort of half-assing the text right here. I mean, those aren't even remotely. I probably could, I mean, if I really cared, I could have got a ruler out and made sure they were all like flush, right? <laughs> Whatever. I mean, literally, I have about 30 minutes to go. We're an hour in, and I have over half the drawing to do. You, I don't know how I pull this off. Like, how did, how did I do this? <laughs> I did this like a month or two ago, so... It's good to... Uh, or maybe even... Before that, maybe it was closer to January. But... And just to remind you all, just a little plug for myself. You can get prints of this at my Etsy store. I got links to it uh, in the uh, the video notes and the podcast notes. And be sure to check out the podcast at sketchcraft.com, C-R-A-F-T dot com. Uh, and you can go directly there with, with sketchcraft.net which will take you right to the podcast page. You can see all my podcasts right there. Also on iTunes. So you type in Sketchcraft and iTunes, you get all the stuff. Got a lot of nifty reviews there. Yay. I know I'm definitely shading this as quick as humanly. I Because this, this I remember. I remember going like, Rob, you better shade the living shit out of this as fast as possible. Now, you want to get some energy, that little stuff that I usually throw around, you just have it just exploding out from this crap. It's like a little technique I use. To quickly add some energy, like it's bursting through. Do 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 do. I do uh, tend to do a little bit of that, a little bit of that singing when I'm trying to pass the time. See, the Skeletor is the funnest thing on here to draw. I knew I was gonna have fun drawing him, so I make myself wait last. <laughs> Plus, anytime you're doing this. You really want to uh, draw what's in front of you first. So you... Ignore that. So you want to draw what's closest to you first because that way you're not drawing through stuff and erasing anything. I 
I'm erasing smudge lines that just naturally occur from the process of drawing. So now I'm like, time for Skeletor. Yeah, this is the part I look forward to. Hood first, right? Big parts first, what's closest to you. A little bit of a Grim Reaper. Definitely made him look uh, non-human. The skull is elongated, seriously elongated. I just wanted something completely different. So just all teeth, big nose, small eyes. Yeah, that's cool. Big evil cheekbone, big evil chin bone. Yeah, I'm not pausing to think about it. I'm pausing because I know I'm going to draw him really fast. <laughs> and I'm going to have to go back and finish that sword. Uh, the battle cat's the one that I only worried about because I really just didn't like my initial sketch. It worked out in the end, but it was uh, effort to get that done nice ratty hood so here we go right how to fill up an area get the big shadow in first so I'm lightly blocking in all the shadow with the 2H trying to give it a little pillowy effect with the shadow it's curving over the surface it's not a flat shadow Hey, we gave a thumbs up. Looking good. Now with the uh, HP, I can go in there and add the dark grit. And tick marks and crosshatch lines. Those little tick lines I do around the shadow edges. Adding a little shadow from the axe. That helps. So almost 30 minutes left exactly. Which is not 30 minutes of real time. It's, you know. It's probably like two hours. But I probably spent three or four up to this point, so. Hey, yeah, he's sort of bleeding on top of his hood there. Has that kind of like Emperor Palpatine feel from like Return of the Jedi where you kind of barely see his eyes. The hood's kind of covering most. You just see the mouth, most of his face. Sorry. The, his hood is covering most of his face and you can just sort of see his mouth. More shadow. As if he wasn't shadowy enough, right? Yeah, this is January. I can tell because my hand is fatter. I don't really get into my personal life too much, but let's just say I've lost considerable weight since then. So, <sighs> Gotta keep yourself healthy, folks. It's hard when you sit and draw all the time. But you gotta do it. Yeah, that went by pretty quick.
I also know that once once he gets into color, he's going to look awesome because he has that purple kind of green motif, you know? I mean, if you're able to think in color, even if you're not coloring your own work, you're a colorist. I mean, sorry, you're a penciler. Even if you're just a penciler and you kind of know that the character's colors are going to really work, you don't have to, like, I'm not saying that you have to try, but, you know, be aware that, hey, you know, sometimes... This character, just by nature of who they are, they're gonna they're gonna steal the scene a little bit, you know. So don't overdo it. Look at those big little like gash marks in the hood. That's cool. Yeah, he's pretty gnarled up, right? Like he's been fighting He Man for for the past six months and he hates He Man. <laughs> and he hasn't changed his clothes. He had a big hood in the He-Man movie. I rather liked him in that movie. I, the movie sucked, but I liked the Frank Langella. Thought he was pretty good. I think that's it, right? For the Skeletor. No, see, I'm just staring back at it like, damn, is it over already? Yeah, it's over. Guess I gotta draw that sword next. Right? Sword first, Rob. I say sword, sword, sword. Hey, it's sword. I honestly don't know. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying what, what I would do next if it were me, because it was me. And uh, But if it were me right now, I would start with that sword. Hey, there's my art gum. And if you see me noodling that like that with my fingers, like kind of like rolling it up, that's me thinking. I'm cleaning up that area because it's smudged a little bit. Sword's popping out at you. I don't know why I'm redrawing that shield armband so many times. It's off camera a little bit too. Not not good, Rob. Look back up at the camera, dude. I'm getting better at this, folks. You know. Uh, if I had if I had someone here like constantly monitoring the camera while I worked, then it wouldn't be my problem. But it's just me. Add those little screws to his sword. I don't know why. Thought they looked cool. Yeah, I'm making the sword three dimensional before I start because it's popping right out at you. Look at that. It's 3D effect. See, at this point, you don't have to be like, I'm blocking in his leg and stuff. They don't have to be perfect. I can do a lot of shadowing and texturing on it because all the main, other than Battle Cat, all the main details are there. This stuff is not, you know, it's not as, as critical. Some big screws to hold that in. When in doubt, add screws. When in doubt, screw it. <laughs> now, there was a big debate. Do I have that tassel go over the sword or under it? But I decided to have it go oh, uh, under it so the sword pops out a little bit more. And, of course, I'll probably have to add, like, a shadow. Like, a secondary shadow to make it really feel like it's underneath that that blade and there's He-Man's leg going behind Skeletor and that's it that's all we're gonna like do with that let's work out the shading
core shadow. X, 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 core shadow, X, 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 X. This is where the HP is your friend because as a thicker lead, it can make these broader strokes. While still remaining uh, sharply tipped. If I went to a 2B, it's not as much. It starts to look more like charcoal after a while. Core shadowing his inner bicep. This is like back in the 90s. They would probably add like that that Scott Williams. Remember they did that, that coloring style where he would add the metallic cross hatching and then it would always be like yellow and orange chrome underneath the bottom part and then it would like fade up into something. I remember they just killed that look when Lee left and the Cuber guys took over and everybody was just ultra metallic, you know? Like that, I don't think that was really the point of the art style, but that's what it became. They did this X-Men 30th tribute anniversary book at Wizard and everybody was just like chrome the fuck out. Like, it's ridiculous. But that's what I like about this style is that he's not, he's not slick, you know, it's very messy. As opposed to just uh, adding like those chrome cross hatches. And we, you know, when you start to like crosshatch one way, crosshatch the other, of course that's obviously, you know, but then you add like extra additional little bits and shadows with the secondary lead and then you add these little tick marks with the tip of your darkest stuff. I mean, it really starts to, it's not all going in one direction, so it adds validity to the shapes. It really, it's, I mean, it's, like, this isn't the sharpest video. I only record 720p and, you know, it's, it's not the greatest pixel length, um, but, you know, if you get one of the prints, uh, and you'll see the amount of pencil depth that these things can have. Uh, it's pretty impressive. Even for not being very clean, you know. It's pretty impressive. I, you know, this part's legitimately fun because I get to just plow ahead, you know, confidently. No, no second guessing here. Yeah, now I'm going back over the sword with the HB. Hand's going to basically be shadow. I know, a lot of effort to blacken that in, right? <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? Ah, uh, shadow. Oh, yeah, he has those grooves on the inside of his shield. And that's where you have to have the character reference out just to kind of double check that stuff. So we have about 15, 19 minutes to go. How does this work out? 
Still got the sword to finish here, the castle to draw in, the moon, and battle cat. I remember not wanting the sword bloody. Like, the axe was going to be bloody and the sword was going to be a little bit more magical. It's going to have some, like, some drips along the edge, but it wasn't going to be, like, totally, totally decked out. Of course, I may have forgotten that <laughs> as I draw blood all over it. Well, I remember that's what I wanted, but I don't think, I don't think I totally committed to that idea, uh, apparently. <laughs> I mean, it's not as beat up as the axe is, you know. You know, with this one, I know when I went to color, I was just very concerned with making sure that all this detail I'm putting into the pencils show up on some way. I did the same thing with Splatterhouse uh, a couple years ago for Game Fan, and when I went to color, I lost a lot of the details in the pencil. So, I was putting all this extra stuff in here just to remind myself, hey, remember all that time you spent drawing it? I mean, don't lose a lot of that. It's looking pretty cool, man. Hot. Honestly, the 15-year-old me never would have thought this would be possible. So, I said, it's me taking a break and then coming back. Probably went and got lunch or something. Obviously, another break. It's Castle Grayskull time. The fastest castle ever. Really, the castle part's just bonus. I didn't have to draw it in, but I thought it'd be kind of cool to put something right there. And I prefer the creepy, the creepy castle. Although the one in the movie was kind of cool too. I initially thought I might use the movie version, but uh, I ditched that. I do like that the drawbridge is his teeth. It's pretty cool. And now with the HB, we block in all the basic shadows and. Get this drawn really fast. Holy hell. Less than 20 minutes to finish the whole thing. I'm looking at the reference of the castle right there. That's, that's what that is. And then the whole stairwell coming down. Just got a lot of shadows and stuff, you know. That's where you can use shadows as your friend. I got the thin uh, two-way shadows and I got the really thick HB shadows. Surprise, you can see the light coming through it. I actually drew this during the day. That's shocking.
I wish I could say more about this process, but this is really where you just sort of, like I'm trying to use the landscape pieces here as like creative edging for the, the border, really. So uh, the, the way I sort of crack it out and everything is just a, it's a way to offset that shape. And now I actually work on the border. Now I'm going to bring a piece of paper. So, because there's so much lead on the page, things will start to smudge if I don't. Now this lead's got to be done pretty quick, right? So I'm going to do the core shadow. Yeah, there's a basic core shadow. Basic course. See how I'm going under, under, and then up, 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 back, 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 back. Under, under, under. Tap, tap, tap. Under, tap, tap, tap. Under. Now I angled it a little bit here so it wasn't so straight on. Yeah, so tap, tap, tick, 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 tick. And switching the way it goes just makes it feel like it's curving over a surface. Pops it forward. I switch to the 2H to do the little secondary shadow. That's where that thinner lead really helps out because it's so thin that next to that dark, uh, heavier lead, it, it really looks like a thinner shadow as opposed to big grit texture. And then just this, all these little, little scuff marks. And as you can see, there's not much to that leg. Now, had I started with the leg, probably would have took me longer. But at this point, you know, pretty much any groove. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. So here we go. Under, under. And again, under. And back. And we take over. Under, 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 under. A lot of shade on that back leg. A lot of shade. Pretty quick. Pretty quick. Uh, draw a little moon right there. Nice 90s comic book artist style moon. I think I changed the border too. Like I had this kind of wavy Struzan kind of bit. Yeah, see, I'm sketching that over. That's because of the moon. I thought it'd be great to kind of like add a little extra something at the top versus just being a square. This is sort of a Drew Struzan technique, this kind of like border style. Hey, if you're going to invoke movie posters, I suppose you should invoke the best, right?
I think at this point I wasn't sure if I wanted the moon cut out or just if I was going to drop it in there. At some point I just dropped the moon in there. And I don't know, let's see, this is me just adding a bunch of little extra ticks while I figure out what I want to do with the moon. You want to just draw it, Rob. Just draw it. And time to draw Battle Cat. So this is not going to be fun. Save this guy for last. But I also knew I'd be at my full peak when I go to do it. So now I think I'm going to draw him with his mouth closed at first. And then I'm going to abandon that because he's looking a lot like Mufasa. <laughs> and I don't know. He just didn't seem aggressive enough. I wanted to actually have him roar and... Like he does in the front of the cartoon. Do, 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 Yeah, I'm going to erase that. Here we go. Oh, I thought that was where I do it. Come on, erase it. You don't like that, Rob. Uh, Rob's not listening. <laughs> I told you to erase it, Rob. I mean, if you just erase it now. You, okay, thank you. Oh, no, 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 no. Wait. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, he's kind of growling. It's about the best I can get out of it. I should have spent more time figuring out the cat, but to be honest, the commission wasn't, I mean, I don't charge a whole lot for these things, so, you know. Definitely not liking those teeth. I was so afraid that I'd get to this point where I, like, I fucked the whole drawing up with the damn cat. So, I don't really know what to do with his mouth. So, in that case, I know what to do with the rest. The mask, I know. It's blades, it's got grit, it's got texture. I will figure the mouth out as I go along. You know? Sometimes that's a way to do it. Just draw what you know you can do and whatever's left, whatever space is left over afterward, just make it fit. And again, you know, if this were like a paid gig, I would probably spend an entire day or two just drawing lions. Like I'd go down to the zoo and, you know, but I mean, I'm, I have to make this up on the spot. So no time for that. There we go. Now he's roaring. I think I did a little side sketch. Like I hit pause and hit somewhere where I wasn't afraid I was going to mess it up. Right there, he roars. There, that's better. That a battle cat. Oh, look. Oh, little, little eraser trick there. Do, 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 do. And it works. Four more minutes. Well, as we're winding this down, this will remind you all again that you can get a print of this if you'd like. It includes the pencils as well as the color version at my Etsy store. Links are in the show notes. Be sure to check out Sketchcraft, C-R-A-F-T dot com for links to my DeviantArt Gallery, Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, and the direct link to the podcast as well. You can also go directly to the podcast by going to sketchcraft.net or typing sketchcraft into iTunes. Your feedback, support, criticisms, ratings, everything means most to me. Please, please, please give me a review on iTunes. Uh, it really helps. And I have the YouTube channel, which you're probably watching this here. Follow that. Always on Twitter. Say hi there. So I will round this out with some music, and I am out of here. Bye.